reading from the Gospel according to Mark. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophet Isaiah. See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The word of the Lord. Take my lips, O Lord, and speak through them. Take our minds, O Lord, and think through them. Take our hearts, O Lord, and set them on fire with love for you. Amen. It's going to be okay. I don't know how many times I have either said those words or heard those words, but I know that it's a lot. It's going to be okay. That's what my mother always used to say to me, or another well-meaning adult would always say to me, whenever, as a child, I would have an accident. And that happened to me a lot. I remember when I was either three or four years old, I was hit by a car, and I came back into consciousness surrounded by a circle of people who were staring down at me and one of those people declared, it's going to be okay. I was also the victim of a horrible softball accident when I was in sixth grade. And it was a real freak accident where the batter was up to bat and the bat came out of his hand directly into my face. Uh, and it broke every bone on the left side of my face and my nose. And it created this magnificent fountain of blood, and it knocked me out. But when I awoke in the midst of all of that blood, someone, one of the adults who was a coach of that softball team, declared to me, Gideon, it's going to be okay. I also remember being shaken awake at summer camp in the middle of the night because my father was on the verge of death in a hospital miles away, and a brusque but truly loving friend, Dick Muma, woke me up by saying, Gideon, you need to wake up. There's an important phone call for you. And then he added, it's going to be okay. I've said it too. When one of my beloved and precious children has hurt themselves and I was the near parent, or when Sarah got a difficult diagnosis, or in the middle of a scary and fiery night, I have offered and I have received <coughs> the same news. It's going to be okay. And maybe you've said this, and maybe you've heard this too. And in none of those moments, Either the times when I have declared it or the times when I have received those comforting words, in none of those moments was anyone ever intentionally lying to me. I believe, and they believed, that everything will be okay. Maybe not now, but soon, everything will be okay. We don't know when, we don't know how, but many of us believe that in the end, everything will be okay. We have hope. We have trust. 
we believe it. Now, I vaguely remember the first time that I heard as a child that God's posture towards me is love, not judgment. And I remember it because I remember it falling on my ears as a new and novel idea. Now, maybe you're hearing this good news for the first time in your life, too, but I believe it's an important truth, and this is it, that God's posture towards you is love. When God looks at you, the first thing that God does is love you. No matter who you are or what you've done, God loves you before anything else. Now, it was much more common in the cultural Christian world in which I grew up to believe that God's first posture towards me was not love, but rather judgment. That God was a distant judge enumerating and recording all of my sins. God would forgive them eventually, but not until after God judged me for them. Forgiveness might follow purgation, It may follow repentance. It may follow acts of contrition. But first came judgment. And maybe you were raised this way too. So in that spiritual framework, God's first and perhaps greatest task is holding humanity to account for their failings. Forgiveness will likely follow, but at some distance. So our natural response to a God like that might be fear. Fear of how God would see us. Fear of how God's impeccable memory for sin would remember us. And that fear made me spiritually anxious. But into that spiritual anxiety, some great 20th century religious figure declared, no, God's first posture towards you is not judgment, but love. And I remember that that good news landed with me with quite an impact, partially because the news was so good and partially because that news was so novel. And their evidence for this was the Bible. I remember hearing, but not who it was that said, that the most frequent declaration from God to humanity is not judgment, but comfort. In fact, The most frequent phrase, and usually the first thing that angels in Scripture ever say to humans, is this. Don't be afraid. Angels who are messengers from God to humanity, however you imagine them, whether as heavenly legates who interrupt history dramatically and gloriously, or earthly prophets who seek to get humanity's attention from the sidelines, most everyone who delivers a message directly from God, begins that declaration in the same way. Don't be afraid. I'm bringing you good news. The prophet Isaiah says it memorably this way. Comfort ye. Comfort ye, my people. Comfort ye. Now, I remember that partly because I am reminded of it every year on the second Sunday of Advent, and partly because that's also the way that Handel's most beautiful and moving oratorio, Messiah, begins, with the tenor soloist declaring, Comfort ye, pom, pom, pom. And then it goes much higher. Uh, (laughs) But it goes on, Comfort ye. That's it. You know it. (laughs) Comfort ye. My people, says your God, says your God. And so Gabriel does when he greets Mary, but of course he says some version of this. He says, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Or, Greetings Mary, God's favored one. And then, Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid is always right there. Don't be afraid is the principal message from God to humanity. Don't be afraid. God is in charge. Don't be afraid. God is with you. Don't be afraid. God is near. Don't be afraid. God is coming. Don't be afraid. God is. 
God is in charge. God is near. God is coming. God will come. God is. So don't be afraid. No matter what you see or how this looks or what's happening right now or what might happen in the near future, don't be afraid because God loves you. God, who is love, loves you. God, who created the heavens and the earth, God, who sustains the world through love, God, who set the stars in their courses, the God who inspires poets and artists, the God whose words are music, that God, that God loves you. And not just in general, you, not vaguely, but particularly you, who you are, all that you are, all that you will be or have been, all that you have done, all that you have failed to do in the perfectness of your particularity, in the particular ways in which you are flawed or you suffer, you, God loves you before anything else. God loves you. So, don't be afraid. No matter what anyone else says, and what, you know, plenty of people out there want us to be afraid, that's not God's desire for us. God wants us to know and to rest in the depth of God's love for us. The love which is shown to us in Jesus so clearly and revealed to us through the crucifixion, that love declares, don't be afraid. It's going to be okay. The Reverend Dr. John Polkinghorne is a 20th century, or was, a 20th century theoretical physicist who taught at Cambridge University, and then he became an Anglican priest, and he was also a noted writer. And in his book, The God of Hope and the End of the World, Dr. Polkinghorne writes that what we tell our children and each other in moments of our deepest fear, which is, it's going to be okay, is because we, we tell that because deep in the core of our being, it is what we believe. That deep in the recesses of our hearts, beyond the level of conscience, in the childish and most ancient parts of our being, no matter what we are going through, we believe that everything will be okay. And when we say this to each other, or we say it to our children, or to someone we love who is suffering, we are not lying, but we are declaring our faith. We believe that in the long run, and perhaps outside the boundaries of our single lives, with God's help, everything really will be Okay, And this declaration points to our bedrock hope, our faith, that God will make everything right. And in this, we are right. Because everything will eventually be okay. Maybe not today. Probably not tomorrow. But ultimately, and then forever, all things will be okay. So don't be afraid, favored one. Behold, I bring you good news of great joy for all the earth. It's going to be okay. We may not be saved from the challenges and indignities of this life. Our bodies may fail. Our hair may come out. Our waistlines go in and out. We get old. We succeed. We fail. We suffer. We celebrate. We make embarrassing mistakes that we can't fix. We break. We also heal. We go through a lot in this life, and some of it is beautiful, and some of it is awful. But in the end, God declares, and we believe, it's going to be okay. So, dear ones, here's the good news. God's first posture towards you is love. God is going to make all things right. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but soon and forever. Everything is going to be okay. 
So don't be afraid. Amen.